this edition of the Raz Report to have Jacob Rayor, um, co-founder and chief, and chief investment officer of Lucy Labs. This um, is going to be an exciting one because he has tons of experience working at hedge funds from Third Avenue and just being in this industry, being at McKinsey. Um, I'm going to stop talking. I'm going to ask questions. Jacob, thanks for coming on the Raz Report today. Well, thanks for having me. Yes. So um, I was excited to have you because you have a lot of interesting experience from crypto to equities, being a multi-billion dollar uh, value fund for many years. Um, but before we get into all that fun stuff, where did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Czechoslovakia. So it was uh, in the 1970s and 1980s, so it was still a communist country. And it was a very different uh, place than, uh, than living here in the U.S. now. So, like, you went through, like, the Velvet Revolution? Yeah, the uh, Velvet Revolution. I mean, uh, one thing I might mention, because it has something to do with crypto, is uh, there was an interesting currency situation in Czechoslovakia. So you had the national currency, which was the crown, and you would uh, that's what you would earn, and you would spend in regular shops. But uh, you also had hard currency stores uh, that had stuff that the regular shops didn't have. And if you wanted to be shopping in those hard currency stores, you needed these special vouchers. Um, that uh, that were exchangeable for a higher currency, and you could go into these stores and, and use these vouchers uh, to pay for you know more luxury luxurious stuff, and nobody would really ask you how how you got your hands on it. It was uh, it was just considered to be okay. And the third currency that was circulating in the country was the Deutsche Mark, and the Deutsche Mark is what you would use if you were planning to go on a vacation abroad, and you needed to you know you were planning to live it up and go to restaurants and buy some souvenirs. So there was really like three currencies in circulation in the country. And there was a gray market where people would be uh, changing from one currency to another. Uh, so I'm kind of familiar with, uh, with a situation where it, technically you have a single currency, but you have actually in reality, multiple circulating currencies with fluctuating exchange rates. And uh, the connection to crypto is that people are talking about now, you know, oh, why would we even have something like Bitcoin running in parallel with uh, whatever the country currencies is? And it's so strange and there would be never any need for it. And I'm like, I, you know, that's normal to me. I grew up with that. That's just absolutely normal state of affairs. Yep. Um, and so you, going with those multiple currencies, do you think then like the Bitcoin revolution would be here to stay? Oh, it's absolutely here to stay. I mean, nobody will uninvent Bitcoin. I mean, we now know that it's possible. Uh, whatever happens to Bitcoin in itself, uh, somebody will come up with a new cryptocurrency. It's just, uh, you know, you'll never put this genie back in, into the bottle. Um, what Bitcoin did was to do something that was considered impossible uh, prior to that. A lot of people have tried to create native internet currency, and they, uh, a lot of them sort of floundered on the same set of problems. Uh, they, it was centralized. It was easy to shut down. Um, it was uh, referring to an underlying fiat or underlying commodity. Uh, and it was difficult to keep the ledger synchronized around the world. And Bitcoin solved all of these problems. Uh, it, it really, it is a real breakthrough in computer science. Got it. And so and it, and it brings you back to when you were growing up in Czechoslovakia where there was multiple currencies, um, et cetera. Yeah, and the problem that Bitcoin solves are very often not problems that we have here in the U.S. Uh, here, you know, the payment systems work pretty well. Banks work pretty well. You're not worried about your ATM stopping working tomorrow. So explaining the value of Bitcoin to Americans is a little bit like, it, it sounds a little bit unreal, you know, the problems that it's trying to solve. But you go outside of the U.S., you go to countries like Cyprus or Lebanon, Venezuela, Iran, they you know, they get it. They I mean, they understand it solves their problems today and here. Got it. Got it. Understood. Um, so going back to uh, back to your upbringing, you ended up going to school, I think, at Yale. Was that from Czechoslovakia or like how did you end up in, at Yale? Oh, it was a little bit circuitous. So I was um, I was going to I was studying electrical engineering in Czechoslovakia. And I was involved in the student strike. Uh, I joined the, the National Student Strike Coordinating Committee, which was part of the uh, Velvet Revolution. And what we did there is we built, um, uh, like, a, we basically built the Czech internet very early on. We connected all the universities across the country, uh, hooked them up, and we used that network to print and distribute 
uh, all the materials that the uh, that the Velvet Revolution leaders were putting out. We were, uh, you know, our goal was to uh, break the monopoly, the media monopoly that the communist media had, and get all this information out into people's hands. And we managed to do that in a space of a week, about a week and a half. We uh, we hooked up basically all the printers and copy machines and fax machines that we could get our hands on, and we were printing we were printing posters and uh, materials by the tens of thousands. We had them, you know, on all the streets in the country, very very quickly. Really, and and did it did it, did it like catch on, or is everyone was it was it becoming a big dealer? Yeah, I mean. It, when the student strike started, it uh, originally was just a couple of schools, and then it snowballed. Uh, it started at the theater academy. Then, you know, we joined at the electrical engineering, and uh, pretty much all the schools very quickly joined on. And 10, year, 10 days after the start of the strike, we were able to organize a general strike where the whole country shut down for two hours. Wow. Uh, to show, sort of to send the message to the government that, uh, you know, we can prove that we have general support for what we stand for. And in order to organize the general strike, you really needed to coordinate all this information, get it out, get it into the right hands. Um, early on, we realized that kind of, again, sort of there's a connection to Bitcoin. The problem really wasn't in trying to encrypt the communication on our network. We didn't really care if the secret service was reading us or not because we were you know, putting it out in posters and all that stuff anyway. The, the real challenge was to authenticate the information. We were worried that uh, the, the state security would try to inject some provocative material in there, try to disrupt us by by sending f uh, false information in there. So authentication was was more of an issue than encryption. And that's yeah. very similar to Bitcoin, where uh, all all the uh, transactions are visible to everyone. Uh, they are not encrypted. You know which address sent how much to what address. But the important part is it's authenticated. You cannot fake sending money. You cannot send money that you don't have. Um, so yeah. Okay. Got it. So that's uh, so that's so then so then you make your way to America and you go to Yale. Does that like change you? The Velvet Revolution shaped the person you are today. Like how how did that play a role? Oh, Yale was a wonderful, wonderful experience. You just you just surrounded with a lot of bright, talented, driven people, and it's uh, uh, you know it was a great environment to sort of encourage you to go and uh, and pursue whatever interest uh, you have. Got it. And you so from Yale, did you go right to your first job? Yep, went straight to McKinsey. Uh, spent a couple of years at McKinsey doing consulting uh, at various places, uh, which was very. What kind, of, what kind of companies were you consulting for while you were at McKinsey? Um, the ones you're allowed a, to say, I guess, it, so. Yes, yes. It was a very interesting uh, b batch of companies. So uh, my first client was uh, was an online service, actually one of the first online services. Uh, this was before internet really caught on. Uh, so in those days, you had the three companies, CompuServe, Prodigy, and AOL, and they had... Uh, they had a strategic issue. You know, what do we do about this internet thing? Are we just going to ignore it? Because, you know, we have much better uh, content on our own network. Or are we going to take this bet that over the long term, the content that's available on the internet is going to be better than what we have inside our walled garden? And, uh, okay, if you decide to take that bet, uh, what does it mean? What kind of uh, technology do we have to build? How do we connect our customers with that? How do we do our marketing? It was really interesting times. It was in the early days of the internet. So did that, like, did you like from that? You're like, I want to be in the internet. Or I want to, like, is that something that you were striving towards, or no? Like, yeah, I mean, it's like basically whatever, whatever I did, I couldn't, couldn't get away from the internet and the technology. All right, it it just yep. follows you everywhere. Yeah. Yep. Okay. And um, then you left McKinsey, and is that when you went to? Marty Whitman's Third Avenue? Well, uh, not directly. At first, I went to Sanford Bernstein. Um, and then I went to Putnam Investments, and then I ended up at Third Avenue. So I, I actually started doing value investing uh, at Sanford Bernstein. I was an equity analyst uh, and then sort of worked my way up, uh, you know, through being more senior all the way to, to, to PM uh, level at Third Avenue. And uh, so I spent a long time... Uh, um, analyzing balance sheets, analyzing companies, analyzing businesses and uh, making investments and, uh, you know, running portfolio construction, running, uh, managing risk and all that wonderful stuff. So at Third um, Avenue, we came all the way to PM and you, you were making adjustments. Once you're like a PM at 
one, how many how many people worked at Third Avenue at the time? Uh, at the time, it was about 100 people in total, of whom about 20 people were in the research department or in the investment department. Got it. Well, what, what made you want to go from McKinsey to Wall Street? Uh, the best part of working McKinsey was doing the strategy, strategy research and sort of thinking longer term. The hardest part of working McKinsey was doing cost cutting. So one of the studies I was on was at an electrical utility where, you know, they had a capital budget that was getting a little bit out of control and you had to go in there and start cutting expenses. So you would go and uh, identify the projects that needed to be uh, slowed down or shut down. And, uh, you know, that's... Uh, it's a pretty stressful situation because you talk to people whose jobs are linked directly to these projects. So they know that if this project gets canned, you know, they may have no future at the company. So they will, you know, they try to fight really hard to preserve it. So you end up in this like hand to hand combat uh, where you're fighting uh, uh, against the people you're trying to help. Uh, it's quite stressful and wasn't all that enjoyable. Um, going into Wall Street and uh, equity investing is very much like becoming a, a strategy specialist, right? You're thinking about longer term issues. You spend a lot of time researching what's going on. But, uh, you know, uh, luckily, you don't have to go there and actually do the hard things that are required to run a business. Yeah, it, it, right. You get to be on the outside and study and make decisions and not have to be the day-to-day -day operation. I get it, I get it. And so, yeah. and, and it's like being a detective. So wonderful thing about it is, uh, is you, you go and dig and dig and you try to dig deeper than anybody else, find out more than anybody else knows. And it's, it's quite exciting. It's an intellectual challenge. So I totally understand that. That's how I got into this whole thing back in the day. Um, so um, then like you were at uh, Whitman for nine years, what made you leave there? Well, the business is getting difficult. Uh, the The active management business on equity side is uh, is shrinking, as you know. Uh, the excitement is kind of uh, leaving the space. Assets are moving to uh, passively managed products. So it, it was just a tough environment to really see much long-term growth. Um, I went and started doing commodity trading, and I really spent the next couple of years sort of retraining myself as a quant. So I did the equivalent of a master's degree in, in financial mathematics uh, at a couple of places and uh, sort of retooled to, to get ready for the new world, which I thought, you know, I didn't see really crypto in the future, but it turned out that that tool set uh, was very, very helpful in entering the crypto market. Got it. Yeah, I know that. And so is that, did you, leave, when you went from Third Avenue, did you get into crypto or was that... Right no, away. that was still a few years in the future. I was focusing on commodity trading, so I was doing uh, systematic quantitative strategies in commodities. And uh, when he started uh, sort of talking about crypto again in 2017, 2018 with my co-founders, uh, we started looking at the market and thinking, hey, you know, I wonder if this stuff would work here. Okay, got it. And, um, and so then, you, you, so, that, so you start re researching this crypto space, you you want to know if this stuff would work here. And is that when you're like, your co-founders, you got ready to create UC Labs or was that later? Yeah, that was pretty much around uh, 2017, early 2018. Um, it turns out the three of us have very complementary skill sets. So my co-founders, one of them uh, came from uh, investment banking and private equity. He was actually the CEO of uh, Lehman Brothers North American Equity Sales. So he's very familiar with that side of the business, with things like prime brokerage, uh, execution, operations, all that stuff. And my, the other co-founder is uh, a technology specialist, and he uh, started his career working at JP Morgan, working on their foreign exchange trading desk when it first became uh, automated in the early 1990s. And his latest project before we started Lucy Labs was uh, he was a consultant for ISDA. Uh, ISDA, you may be familiar, is the... Uh, is the organization that regulates over-the-counter derivatives trading. And they had a long project sort of stemming from the financial crisis in which they are forcing over-the-counter traders to put up margin. Historically, o OTC trades were done without margin, uh, which led to problems when Lehman blew, blew up. Um, and uh, the ISDA SIM margin project went on for several years to create the methodology for to calculate margin requirements for any derivative ever traded anywhere in the world. So you can imagine that was a huge project. And uh, our co-founder, Rob, was a, was the lead consultant on that. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. And so, so that, okay. So, that, so then 
you're so you well, let's go so you're lucy labs you start this in 2017 18 is there like something like okay here's what we're going to be or is it like we're we're in crypto we got to figure out a business and go along with it like what was the when you put your shingle up what's the first like two things you're doing well, the first thing is, is let's figure out what, what works here. I mean, this is a completely new market that we don't know anything about, which is very exciting, uh, but, you know, a little bit scary, too. So roll up our sleeves and start uh, figuring out how to do execution here, how to find investment opportunities, how to get historical data, how to put it all together and, and roll, out, uh, roll out an investment strategy. And uh, so we did that, you know, we were a prop trading uh, uh, fund for, for three years. We're doing it with our own money and, uh, you know, investigating as much as we could about the market. Got it. And are there a lot of, like, are there things that work in traditional finance, but that don't, that don't work in crypto? Uh, absolutely. So I would say even most things in traditional finance don't really work in crypto. So coming in as a, as a value investor, there's really no value investing in crypto. It's very difficult to figure out intrinsic value for sure. any of these projects. I mean, people have tried, we have certainly tried. Uh, it's a very difficult problem. And uh, I don't think that anyone has found a way to make it work. Um, what does work is uh, momentum-based strategies. So momentum is something that has worked on all sorts of assets over long periods of history. And uh, so when we started looking at crypto, we had this theory that, you know, it probably will be working in crypto as well. And we were pleasantly surprised how powerful the momentum factor is within crypto. Um, it, is, uh, it is actually quite surprisingly powerful. Crypto is very much driven by sentiment, by retail trading, and uh, momentum just captures that very, very well. Got it. And so... Um this volatility, this macro volatility, what, what do you make of it in the crypto space the past few weeks? Well, you know, we've been in this space for, for years and uh, this is just par for course. This is actually not even particularly painful period in the sense that uh, we've lived through the bear market of 2018. We've lived through the uh, 2020 early years. Um, in the bear market in 2018, just to give you a, a little comparison, Ethereum was down 95% uh, from peak to trough in a space of less than a year. I mean, that's a very, very painful situation. Uh, Bitcoin was down over 80% peak to trough. Uh, so that's, that's what a bear market in crypto looks like. Um, similarly, in uh, 2020, in March 2020, we went through a 24-hour period in which Bitcoin dropped 50%. In 24 hours, um, it was it was just. When crazy. was that? When was that? In March 2020. Okay. Yeah, not that long ago. So yeah, where are you in crypto? You have to deal with the volatility. Uh, your models have to take that into account. You cannot be leveraged. Uh, you your risk management has to be you know on top, and uh, you just have to expect that there is uh, there is always something scary happening. Right, and and you and so for you guys, you guys trade your own money. You also have accredited investors through a fund. Um, I know you can't really talk about that, but how do you guys go about trading in crypto? Like what do you, are you at short term or what, what do you guys do on this stuff? So we do a bunch of things. So I can sort of describe a few of those things. So uh, let's talk about the momentum trading. Uh, we have a pretty active uh, program in which we take uh, long positions in crypto coins when momentum is positive and we go to cash when momentum turns negative. Uh, so there is, uh, there is. How do you judge that based on the momentum? Yes. You look at the recent historical performance and, uh, in general, there is a auto correlation of performance. So things in crypto that have gone up recently have a tendency to keep going up and things that have gone down recently have a tendency to go down. So that's the bet you want to be taking. Uh, the downside is you will miss the turning points. Uh, so when things start bouncing off a bottom or when this thing, things start rolling at the top, you're going to miss that. But that's actually over the long term, that's a price that uh, that's beneficial to pay. So we would uh, when there is a bear market in crypto, th things start selling off. We would generally go into cash. And that's certainly what we've been doing uh, most of this year in that uh, our models started putting us into cash uh, towards the end of last year and towards the beginning of this year. And we were, we were almost completely in cash for the past uh, month or so. Just from seeing models of, of sentiment or momentum of the price moving? Purely, purely price momentum. 
Wow. And I mean, you don't you don't necessarily even need a very elaborate model. Sort of any sort of trend model will tell you to get get out of the market over the past month or so. So then how do you know when to get in? You wait and you miss the bottom. You see the market turning around, you see the price momentum picking up, and then then you jump back on. With the expectation you will probably get in 10, 15% above the bottom price. Uh, but again, in the long term, that's a very good trade-off to take. Got it. Okay. So, so when you look to get back, like, so are you guys getting back in now, or what's your? No, we're still we're still waiting for things to stabilize. Okay. And so, do you have do you, in your when you're looking at your data, is there like what do you think that is, or what do you? Think no, it, uh, one thing I've learned is not to try to predict the markets. It's it's way too hard. So I you know I have no idea when this will turn. Uh, is there more downside? It's possible. I mean, again, in 2018, we've seen 85 to 90 percent drawdowns in in crypto. So it's certainly possible. Uh, is that what's going to happen? I have no idea. We're gonna we're gonna let our models tell us when to get in. Uh huh. And um, so do you so right if you're in cash, are you in straight cash or are you doing stable coins? What, how do you handle that? So there's there's uh, so we can talk about that. There's there's a number of things you can do in the crypto market if you want to be market neutral. Uh, there are strategies that you can do to generate returns. So I can I can mention a few mention a few of them. So one is uh, uh, a trade that does have a counterpart in traditional markets, uh, and it's called a basis trade. Uh, the idea there is um, you may have a derivative, let's say a future, that's trading at a different price from the underlying. Uh, so you can have a future on Bitcoin trading at a premium to the spot price of Bitcoin. And a simple trade is you can go short the future, you can buy the underlying spot. And at the future expiration, that gap is going to close and you're going to collect that spread. So that's the traditional basis trade. Uh, that works in traditional markets. People do this in US treasuries and commodities and all sorts of things. Uh, but it also works in crypto. And in crypto, there's actually a slightly uh, a different version of this. The dominant product in crypto trading is a perpetual swap, which looks a little bit like a future, but it has no expiration. Uh, and the way the mechanism works is that when there is a difference between the derivative price and the underlying price, there's a funding rate that goes from one side to the other. When the derivative is more expensive than the spot, uh, the people who are long are paying people who are short. So you can put a short position in the perpetual swap. You can uh, put a long position uh, in the spot and collect the funding rates. And that's a, that's a trade that historically has been providing returns of about 10 to 15% per year. Uh, there are periods when it makes more money than that. I mean, when there is a lot of speculative uh, excitement and speculative mania, uh, we have seen it book uh, 30, 40% annualized. And then there are times when uh, you know people run away from the market and you will be generating maybe zero, you know, low single digits. Got it. Okay, so that that's not the average. Like, for example, I mean, I don't do that. Like, I personally put some money in stable coins USDC. Right? Mm -hmm. Do you do you look at that part of? Because what you're describing too complicated for me. I would understand. Right? <laughs> sure. Sure. Yeah. So yeah, well, you... stable coins, stable coins are there. Stable coins is a safe place to be when when things start falling apart. But of course, stable coins, you know, we have seen is uh, it's 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 full of it's a minefield as well. And uh, so I can sort of give you my my take on the whole stable coin uh, market. Yeah. You, you, there are multiple kinds of stable coins. Uh, there's the very simple kind that works sort of like a money market fund in traditional finance. There, it's a fully backed by reserves, and the stable coin is just a token. Token. It works like a share in the underlying fund, and the fund hopefully is fully collateralized and always has 100% of their assets in cash or cash-like products. So USDC is a great example of that. Right. That's. Uh, 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 that's a stable coin that's fully backed with would you say that products. would you say that's versus like USDT or any of those that's algorithmic would you say USDC is very safe I would say USDC is very safe I would also put USDT in that so people think that USDT is algorithmic stable coin but it's not it's uh, exactly the same idea as USDC they are also backed by reserves uh, they started disclosing their their reserves and the composition of their reserves, so you can look at their statements and sort of figure out 
how well backed they are and how much confidence you can have in them. So USDT is actually a fully backed stablecoin, uh, and it's not subject to the same uh, run on the bank. Oh, sorry, the same problem that the algorithmic stablecoins have. Algorithmic stablecoins are a completely different beast, um, and there are there are really two kinds. So uh, you can imagine a situation where you do not have U.S. dollar reserves backing you, but you can have crypto reserves backing the dollar peg value of your stablecoin. You know, because crypto is so volatile, what you need to have is you need to be over collateralized, right? You want to have, if you're issuing $1 worth of stable coins, you probably want to have at least $2 worth of crypto backing you. Because if crypto falls down 50%, you're still fully backed and, and you're reasonably well run. So over collateralized stable coins are, you know, they're not necessarily that great because crypto can fall more than 50%, but at least it's kind of a reasonable stab at uh, approaching this problem. There is a whole another class of algorithmic stablecoins that are under collateralized. So they issue $1 worth of liabilities effectively, and they have less than $1 worth of assets. And that is crazy stuff. And those are bound to blow up. And Terra USD uh, was definitely one of those uh, where they were under collateralized. They issued these billions of dollars worth of the pegged stablecoin. And the mechanism that they had was saying, well, uh, if somebody comes in, if a lot of people come in and try to convert to US dollar at parity, we have this other things that we can print unlimited amounts of, and we're going to print this thing and we're going to sell it. And that, that way will generate the value for the stable coin, which obviously is insane because when you have a run on the bank, when you have a run on the stable coin, uh, you, the value of the stuff that you are printing is starting to collapse. So you have to keep printing more and more and more to generate the same amount of value. And you end up diluting that, that second asset to zero and you end up breaking the peg. A US, the Terra USD is not the first one where it happened. There was a bunch of other ones in the past. It is absolutely amazing to me that people kind of keep falling for this. Uh, but you know, here we are. Uh, people put uh, tens of billions of dollars into this. Yeah, I mean, and, and so I guess part of it is the people did it because there are huge returns, like I'm saying 20%, 25%. So people are getting greedy maybe, or they thought the algorithm thick. Cause I know, I mean, one of the big, uh, one of the big funds was in, in galaxy, I think was in the stable coin, the algorithm, algorithmic. What do you think got people so into it? I guess. Well, you know, there's the old saying uh, in the markets, you know, bulls make money, bears make money and pigs get slaughtered. Uh, right. You know, people just got really piggish. Uh, these 20% uh, yields, that sounds amazing, right? You have 20% yield, in theory, zero risk. It's all US dollar denominated. You can just put your money in what looks like a bank and, and generate returns that don't look anything like what would you get from a bank. And a lot of people found that they're irresistible. Got it. Okay. Uh, I, think that, I think a lot of people did understand that these yields are unsustainable and they are, uh, they are funded by... The VC investors or the um, or the launch funds that that uh, Luna, the project behind the stable coins, raised. So they they understood that these twenty percent yields wouldn't last, but they thought, you know, I'll just collect them for as long as I can and get out. And you know, as as we know, getting out is the hard part. Yeah, um, getting out is the hard part. And so when you have when you're in cash, I don't know if you can say specifically, but do you guys do just like, hey, I'm going to buy some USDC or Sure. Yeah, we do that. And yeah. did you? What about Terra Luna? No, forget it. Uh, nothing. Nothing algorithmic. We we wouldn't uh, we wouldn't feel comfortable with that. That okay. Um, there there is actually an interesting innovation going on. So I I would say there is one potential new kind of algorithmic stablecoin that is you know interesting to watch. Right now it's it's tiny. It's still an experiment. We'll see if the experiment is successful or not. But the idea is. Um, similar to what I just described about the basis trade, right? So when you have a basis trade, you sell uh, a derivative and you buy the underlying spot. What you actually generate is like a synthetic stable coin. You, you create a synthetic dollar that way. Uh, and there are people out there who are trying to generate, to, to create synthetic dollars exactly by doing this, by putting these offsetting positions on the derivatives and the spot markets. And they're doing it on decentralized exchanges. 
So that uh, that is an interesting idea because it's not really subject to the same risk that the traditional algorithmic stablecoins are, because even in a run, you should be able to liquidate both sides and uh, and be able to defend the peg. Now, it's still early days. There's only, I think, a few million dollars sort of experimenting with this approach. And a lot of this depends on the infrastructure outside of these folks' control. So if you are issuing a stable coin like that, you need fairly liquid markets in the derivatives that are that you use to back this up. Those markets have to provide 24-7 uh, availability. They have You have to be able to withdraw money fairly quickly. So the infrastructure really needs to be there. And... Uh, you know, the danger is that we are still too early and the infrastructure cannot support that. But it is a very interesting experiment. Got it. And so do you guys try to get involved with these experiments or are you just watching and seeing if it's an we're, investment? Option? We're watching. We're watching at this point. We're watching and, you know, cheering on from the sidelines. The, the whole crypto space is a thousand experiments, right? Yep. A lot of them failing as you know, all experiments do, but this is an unexplored space. This is like, you know, you discovered America and everybody jumps on a ship and sails across the ocean. A lot of them get eaten by, uh, by cannibals and a lot of them get drowned and a lot of them don't make it, but few of them do make it and, and build, uh, build the United States. So do you, yeah, do you think there should be more regulation in the crypto space? Uh, regulation is coming. Uh, there's no doubt about it. Uh, regulation makes sense when the market is a little bit more mature and it becomes obvious what is the right thing to do and what is not the right thing to do. Regulators are not really equipped to sort of uh, know upfront what is a good idea and what is a bad idea. And in right now, you see a lot of the regulators around the world, including the U.S., sort of stepping back and trying to figure out what the heck is going on. What should we allow? What should we not allow? Uh, and that allows the space to do a lot of experimentation. And sort of by learning, we're going to discover what is a good idea and, and what we should just not let happen again. I think algorithmic stablecoins is a very dangerous idea, and we're, we're getting a lot of uh, evidence for that, and I think the regulation is going to uh, clamp down on that. At the same time, fully backed, reserved stable coins uh, are sailing through this crisis pretty well, and I think the regulation again should should reflect that and encourage that sort of product as opposed to the more uh, algorithmic ones. Okay, here's a random question: Lucy Labs, where did the name come from, or who is Lucy? Lucy, yes, that's uh, yes, our our CTO is uh, came up with that. Uh, do you remember the the, the fossil uh, early man, Lucy, uh, the Australopithecus found in East Africa? I should at least say yes. <laughs> yes. So there was uh, there was a fairly famous find in the 1970s of the early human, like before humans really evolved to to become modern humans. And it's so it's it's a uh, it harkens to that. It's like yeah. early steps in this new world that is that is being uh, that is developing in front of our eyes. Well, that's what I was thinking. Just <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yeah, you were right. So Lucy Labs, I know you have clients that like for the fund. What else does Lucy Labs do? Like, can someone listening to this the Raz report today, you know, inquire in like what what? Yeah, we do. Uh, we are we are publishing uh, sort of reports on some of the aspects of the industry that we find interesting that we think other people might find interesting so we have uh, uh on medium we we just launched a blog talking about crypto products uh, i mean the first post specifically talks about perpetual swaps the history of them it's a product that's unique to crypto it doesn't really have a, an exact equivalent in traditional finance so we spend a little bit of time kind of explaining how it works and what are the tricky things to be aware of uh, of working with that. And uh, we're really enjoying that. So I think we'll be doing a lot more of that. Perpetual swaps, is that anything to do with like future? Like like perpetual swaps, um, what is that? To do? Is that like stuff that you make trades on or you guys are right about it so other people can understand it? So perpetual swaps, it's it's super interesting. It's a, it's a version of a future. Uh, traditional futures have an expiration date. So usually every three months or so, uh, the future expires and it's settled either with the yeah. underlying or it gets settled in cash. And uh, when, when the crypto exchanges started taking off, that was the product that they offered. And they discovered that uh, retail investors actually had a real trouble managing futures and managing the expirations. People would forget that you know third Friday in June or whatever is the expiration date. 
and they would you know log into their account once every two weeks and one day they would log into their account and the position was gone and they would be like oh my god what's happening so uh, the traditional futures turned out to be uh, not a great fit for crypto so a number of exchanges started experimenting and one of them called bitmex uh, which was based in hong kong in those days uh, sort of they played with different things. They tried to shorten the futures to have expiration every 48 hours, then every 24 hours. And finally, they decided, what if we never expire this thing? Just make it perpetual. Well, then the issue you have, how do you make sure that the swap price doesn't drift away completely from the underlying? If you don't have expiration that will force those two prices to converge, how do you make sure they don't just, you know, it just doesn't walk off into space somewhere? And uh, the... The innovation they came up with is they, they first started thinking of uh, referencing some outside interest rate that would, uh, and you would charge the people who were sort of on the wrong side of the trade. So if the future was too expensive, they would charge people who were long. And the question is, how do you set an interest rate in, in crypto? Like, what is the Bitcoin interest rate? There's really no good answer for that. So they, uh, they decided, well, let's just generate it endogenously. Let's just generate it from the price itself. Let's just look at the difference between the price of the swap and the price of the underlying, and let's charge that difference. That will force people who are long to, you know, to be paying a lot of money, and hopefully it will incentivize them to close the position and, and sell the long position, which will force it back to the equilibrium price. And when they first sort of came up with that, nobody knew if it would work or not. It was a real experiment. It was a kind of stab in the dark. And uh, in the first six months, it was pretty hairy. The prices were all over the place. The, the underlying, uh, sorry, the, the swap price was drifting away from their underlying and it was a little bit chaotic. But after about six months, uh, ARPs figure out how to, how to play this game, how to push it for, uh, closer to the, to the fair value. And uh, over the past two or three years, that market has really matured and it became the predominant way of trading crypto outside of the U.S., so uh, the um, perpetual swap markets are anywhere on the order of five to 10 times greater than the underlying spot markets. Okay. So, so, and this, I mean, is this stuff that it's like finding these opportunities, like you were like, one of the things you mentioned earlier with Marty Whitman, you kind of like are an investigator and you're looking for opportunities at companies and you can value invest and see stuff that people aren't seeing. Is this, is this kind of like opportunities that as you a fund manager looking at things like this, take advantage when there's that arbitrage play, but when it gets caught, let's move on to the next thing. It's very similar. It's again, you're being a detective and, and you sort of constantly ask questions like what's going on and why. I mean, the, the, the way we really wrapped our head around the perpetual swaps was we were, we were taking regular positions in the spot markets and then we saw liquidity is much better in the perpetual swaps. So, you know, why not start trading that? We started trading it. We're getting hit with these funding costs. And we're like, oh, we hate paying these funding rates. You know, hear me out. What if we start collecting them instead? How would you go about it? And very quickly, we figured out, you know, okay, you can create the synthetic position and, and do this. Um, and uh, yeah, you stay, you learn by doing. So the way you've discovered these opportunities, you are active in the space, you trade, you, you do experiments, and you discover things that you didn't realize were happening. And you find new opportunities all the time. And we'll help amplify your blog and get people to get the word out. Because, um, I mean, if you're writing about the stuff that people aren't paying attention to, it's definitely an opportunity for making alpha, um, making returns. Um, what advice, and we'll, final couple questions, what advice do you have for crypto investors? Do you mean retail investors or institutional? I think my advice would be very different to those two groups. <laughs> It's a good question. Let, let, let's go with let, let's just go with both. I would love to hear what you have to say for both. Okay, I would say with retail, uh, crypto is a very risky, very volatile asset space. Uh, you do want to be in it longer term, but be aware that these uh, eighty percent drawdowns are happening and are likely to happen for the foreseeable future. So, position sizing is the most important thing you need to worry about. Uh, if things get really tough, can I? Can I survive this? You know, uh, don't don't put don't put on too big a position, and definitely uh, do not put on leverage. Uh, retail investors tend to get in trouble with uh, too much leverage on their positions. Okay. Uh, but longer term, I mean, crypto is very likely to be around. 
uh, for for a long time. And learning about it is uh, is best done by trading and being active in the market. So, you know, be there and trade it, but keep it small enough that you can afford the pain of the downturn, similar to what we're seeing today. Um, yeah, for, yeah. for institutional investor, my advice is uh, slightly slightly different. I would still say you should be experimenting in this market. Uh, for you guys, the interesting thing is the infrastructure for trading that's being built in crypto markets is, I would say, 100 years ahead of what's in the traditional markets that you are used to. The efficiency and effectiveness of the trading platforms is, is going to absolutely steamroll the traditional trading venues. And uh, I would recommend to sort of start learning about how things work there so that when it happens, you know, you'll be prepared. Um, I'll give you an example, sort of the, the huge difference between uh, traditional infrastructure and the crypto infrastructure. In traditional infrastructure, uh, let's say you trade futures. And the way, let's say you're trading futures on uh, wheat, for, for example. So you have to put up a margin. And okay. at the end of each day, uh, that uh, the your position is marked to market and uh, the exchange calculates any additional margin that's needed. And you have, you know, until the next morning to come up with the cash to, uh, to keep the position. Right. In that period between the calculation of the margin and depositing of the cash, the exchange is at risk, right? If, if you actually go bankrupt, the exchange may not be able to collect and, you know, they have a fund to, uh, to, to kind of insure them against that, but it is a real business risk for the exchange, which is why they set the margins very high uh, to, to sort of live with uh, having that risk on their balance sheet. So the size of the margin is a function of the payment cycle and the settlement cycle. In traditional finance, the settlement cycle has to be at least 24 hours because the traditional payment rails take 24 hours to get you know, your, your payment from your bank to the exchange or the broker and settle it. So by nature, they cannot offer high leverage in the products that they trade just because of the settlement counterparty risk issue. You go to crypto exchanges and you realize that they have, they recalculate the margins at a much higher frequency. Uh, you know, the exchange I mentioned, BitMEX, actually, they started recalculating margin on every tick. So every trade happens, they go and go through a million accounts that they have and recalculate the margin requirements immediately. So they don't have that 24 hour sort of delay uh, for them to be at risk. They can liquidate positions much faster than that. Because of that, they can lower their margin requirements. And some of these guys used to offer hundred times leverage. I mean, thankfully they sort of reduce that now, but you can still get 20 to 25 times leverage on your crypto positions. Uh, the exchanges can afford to do that without putting themselves at risk because of this much faster settlement cycle that they have available. Now, if you are an institutional trader and you're doing things like hedging, you're doing things like uh, arbitrage, where do you want to execute? You obviously want to execute at the place with lower margin requirements because you'll have a better capital efficiency. You'll have a higher return on capital. So liquidity is likely to stay at these crypto exchanges that have the newer technology. And we're seeing that uh, clearly in, for example, the Bitcoin futures market. CME rolled out their Bitcoin futures product in, uh, what is it, December 2017, right? So it's four years now. And uh, they only have about 5% market share in global Bitcoin futures trading, which is amazing. I mean, CME is a, is a leading venue for derivatives trading how come they cannot get more uh, market share than that and and the response is because of the how slow their settlement cycle is they are requiring 35 percent margin for any bitcoin position while the uh crypto exchanges are doing you know they may ask for three to five percent margin for the same position so again as an institutional investor you'll be better off trading on these new style exchanges mm. now okay. These guys, the, the crypto exchanges, are coming into the U.S. So right now there is a, there is a hearing in front of the Congress Senate, Senate Agriculture Committee, and, uh, and there is an application with the CFTC in which FTX, which is one of the leading crypto exchanges, is trying to bring this 24-7 trading in commodities with instant margin, uh, margin calculation and instant uh, settlement. 
So T plus zero seconds. Uh, if they get, if this gets approved, and really there's no reason why it shouldn't be, it, it, it needs to work its way through the regulatory process. But uh, if this gets approved and you will get a fully regulated exchange with these parameters, I mean, can you imagine what that's going to do to people like CME? Um, their, their technology is completely unprepared for competition with this sort of, uh, with this sort of competitor. And this is where FTX can really drive huge growth. I, uh, so I have great admiration and respect for the CEO of FTX, uh, yeah. Sam Beckman fried he's, he's an amazing entrepreneur, uh, and he is very ambitious, and he's very clear that his long-term goal is to replace the traditional finance trading infrastructure in the U.S. with this new generation of, uh, of technology that literally is 100 years ahead. The reason CME is doing things this way is that that's how you did it in 1868 when you were started. When you literally had a guy, you know, in the morning, run to the bank with a check, and deposit it with a clerk on the exchange at 7:30 a.m. And if the check wasn't there by 8:30 a.m., the positions would be liquidated. That's and it's baked into all of their systems. They are. It, it will not be easy for them to to upgrade their system to be able to compete with this. Yeah, I met with him and talked to him around the Super Bowl in California, wearing his shorts and t-shirt, and you know, just. Passionate as ever, that guy. He's, he's very amazing. focused, amazing, amazing focus and execution ability. He's definitely somebody to watch. I think he's the he's the uh, the caliber of Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk or or uh, you know that level of entrepreneur. I, I think he'll they'll do great things. I I agree. I I agree. Um, so um, okay, the, we asked that there was. Um, did you guys? Okay, let me see if there's anything else we want to hit up. Um, do you personally buy Bitcoin or like, were you early in investing in Bitcoin? <laughs> oh yeah. Way too early. Yeah. I, uh, yeah, I bought my first Bitcoin back. Uh, oh my goodness. Must have been 2013 or something like that. Do you remember what the price was or no? Yeah, it was $14. Yeah. I remember. Shut up. Yeah. And did you, the, did you keep it? Yeah, well, I bought it at $14 and watched it go to two. So that was my that was my introduction to the Bitcoin market. I, I was down eighty percent, like within a month uh, of my mm. of my purchase. Uh, so, then, so yeah, it was a small amount of money. It was really sort of toe in the water. Uh, in those days, uh, you had to trade on Mount Gox, so you would have to open an account in Japan, and uh, that that in itself was an experience. And uh, so yeah, my Bitcoin was sitting on Mount Gox, and uh, things were kind of shaky. Rumors started flying around about problems at Mount Gox. But what really kind of got me going was when I noticed that uh, Bitcoin on Mt. Gox was trading at a premium to other exchanges. And I was like, why is that? This is kind of strange. And then I sort of started poking around at what was going on. And I realized that they, uh, they had trouble meeting their US dollar redemption requests. So the only way for people to get their money off of Mt. Gox was to buy BTC and then transfer BTC out of the exchange, which drove BTC price on that exchange above the fair market value. So it was like a market signal that something is wrong here. And uh, you know, I, I listened to that signal and I actually got most of my position out uh, before uh, before Mt. Gox blew up. Wow, okay, I mean, so that, yeah, I mean you're paying attention. I mean, that, I mean, that's what you do. I mean, you, from Morgan, I mean, from uh, McKinsey, Working uh, for Marty Whitman, I mean, you're finding these opportunities, and that's what you know. You guys have your fun for, and uh, you know, from what I hear is that you're a freaking genius with your with co-founders, and um, that's why I wanted to have you guys on. Um, what I guess one final question: um, What do you have a favorite crypto coin? <laughs> I'm I'm still partial to Bitcoin. You know, my first love. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. And then, wait, the last one is, what's your worst or your first job? That's a question we used to always ask. My worst or my first job? Yep, you can, worst or your first one. Oh, I got, I got, I got plenty of those. Uh, yeah, um, your worst or your first. So if you don't have a... Like, yeah, what? I was... Uh, <laughs> I, I did all sorts of things. I was I was painting. I painted houses. I worked in the fields. I worked in bakeries. Wow. Uh, wow. You know, so it's a it's a very wide range of things. And honestly, they're all fine. You know, any any job is uh, is what you make from it. What you make of it. 
you can you can have a lot of fun just painting a house. I, I sure did. And if people want to check you out at Lucy Labs, where should they go? It's LucyLabs.com and click on LucyLabs.io. Lucy .io. .io. That's .io. .io because we're a hip. We're with. You're with it. .io. Yes. Check out LucyLabs.io, and they can reach out if they have questions about investing. Um, you're not doing any of those uh, algorithmic uh, crypto stable coins, so that's good. Um, I'm tired of hearing about Terra and all these things. You know, everyone's thinking USDC is done too. So um, I, I did sell a little bit of USDC just because I got a little nervous, you know, but I guess it has nothing, they'd have nothing to do with each other, do they? Yeah, and I, you know, I can share my experience. In 2008, uh, when I was at Third Avenue, we got, uh, we had some money involved, uh, invested in prime reserves, which was a money market fund that uh, invested in some Lehman paper. And they were the fund that actually broke the buck uh, and went through some difficult period. And Third Avenue was actually a lead plaintiff in the litigation that sort of followed. And uh, so uh, I have some experience kind of with the worst case scenario, even with these uh, backed, fully backed money market funds. And uh, sort of just remind people that even with all the bad stuff happening there, the, the final recovery was 99 cents on the dollar for the prime reserve fund and the 97 cents on the dollar for the for the uh, the more uh, more uh, sort of more affected uh, fund. So if you have a fully backed uh, money market like instrument, even in the worst case scenario, you're not necessarily looking at huge losses. It's very unlikely you're gonna you, end up going but, to zero. But in that example of the algorithmic uh, stablecoin, would you say that's the same thing? Or? For the algorithmic stablecoin, no, you can definitely go to zero. Yes. Yeah. So I'm only uh, talking about the fully backed, uh, reserved USD, USDC. USDC. Yep. Yeah, yeah. I probably didn't need to sell a little bit of it, but I did, and I just you know sw move it around to a few different places instead of having it mainly at one place. You know, like yep. like uh, you know, I use Voyager, Coinbase, uh, BlockFi. You know, the whole thing, and maybe just allocate it. But I hear you, and I mean, I know Circle ministers at all. So, um, all right. Well, as you have updates, Jacob, I. I mean, you're gonna you, see you're, you. You find these arbitrage opportunities. You, I mean, this is like crypto uh, one, not one one. It's like four hundred one in the sense that you find opportunities before they exist to the public market. So I mean, pay attention to LucyLabs.io's blog. Um, I mean, you're you're a guy that you know went from started and built this whole thing up, and uh, that your your story about the protest back in the day. Um, I mean, you have you have all the stories there. So. One day, one day you're going to write that book. <laughs> That's right. We'll wait for all the witnesses to sort of disappear. And then, yeah, there you go. Then I'll, I'll write my version of the story. Yeah, there you go. There you go. All right. Well, thank you for coming on the Raz Report. We appreciate it. I know we went longer, but you have amazing information. I'm actually going to listen to it again because there's some things that I didn't, you didn't understand the first time. Sometimes you have to listen two or three times because when you're dealing with someone, your kind of brain. That's what it takes, you know, so thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you for, for having us on the show. Yep, appreciate it.